Hello, this is Jason Clement, Technical Sales Manager at Isonus, and welcome to the Certification Training Module. This module is Introduction to Networks, Part 1. Our course objectives are understand how devices communicate on the network, understand some of the key protocols used on the network relevant to an Isonus installation, understand how this affects Isonus plug-and-play application, and the plug-and-play application is how we find Isonus devices on the network. Understand how the different network devices work together. So let's jump right in with the Open Systems Interconnection Model, or the OSI model. This is a unifying standard for the architecture of networking systems. So basically, if I have two PCs and they want to communicate to each other, and I'm sitting in front of PC1, I see basically the application layer on my side, and the other person on PC2 sees their application layer. When I want to send information, so if I package up an email and I send it out, it goes down the application layer all the way to the physical layer, which is basically the cable. It's then sent over that physical layer to PC2, and then on their PC it goes from the physical layer to the application layer where the other person sees it on their screen. So we're going to talk about layers 1 through 4, which starts at the physical layer. So the physical layer defines the electrical and physical characteristics of the transmission media. Basically, this is the cabling layer. So all of your CAT5e, CAT6, fiber connections, all of that are included in the physical layer. Hubs are also included in this layer. We don't generally see hubs anymore, but it's a good demonstration of how networks work and a good starting point. This is the simplest layer, yet a lot of problems happen at this layer. If you have a bad fiber termination, or a bad CAT5 termination, or your jack's not plugged in, any of those things could cause serious issues of communication on the network. So how does a hub work? Let's say PCA wants to send a frame to PCH. It has some information it wants to send over to them. So PCA sends the frame down the wire to the hub. The hub takes that information in, and it basically shouts it out every single port to all the PCs out there. All the PCs take it in, they look at it, and if it's not for them, they just discard it. If it is for them, they take the information and they process it. So this is similar in the old days to the town crier. You had a town crier in the center of town, and he'd shout out information to everybody around who could hear them. If another town crier heard him that was further away, he'd shout out more information. So if you have hubs connected together, you're going to have this huge, what we call, collision domain. So all of these packets may collide with each other and cause serious problems on the network. Next, we'll move to the data link layer. The data link layer provides node-to-node -node data transfer. The main items in this layer are MAC addresses and switches. Every single device that can connect to an Ethernet network has a burned-in address, which is the MAC address. Your phones have it, your mobile devices have it, PCs have it. Anything that connects to the network or to the Internet, it has a MAC address burned into it. It is six groups of two hexadecimal digits divided into two parts. So if you look on the left, the two parts are your organizationally unique identifier, which is basically the manufacturer. So if you look at a whole batch of network jacks from the same manufacturer, they'll have the first six hexadecimal digits. And then the second part is your network interface controller, and that's going to be your kind of random code that's specific to just that device. A network switch can be thought of as an advanced hub. So let's take a look at how a switch works. Let's say PCA wants to send something to PCH. It sends a frame down the wire to the switch. The switch takes a look at it, and it says, oh, that's a PC on port 8. It looks at the MAC address, and it says, okay, this is going to go out port 8. And it just sends it to PCH. So we don't have that broadcast like we do at Hub, so we can actually control that traffic a lot better. Now let's say PCE wants to send something to PCF. If we take a look at PCF's MAC address, it is not in our table. So when PCE sends that frame to the switch, the switch doesn't know what to do with it. So it's going to broadcast out every port except the port it came in on and say, hey, does anybody know where this PC is at? The rest of the PCs will discard it because they don't know. But PCF will say, hey, that's me. It'll send a frame back to the switch. And then the switch will say, awesome, I know of another PC on the network. And it will add that information to its table. Now, in reality, every time I power this PC up, it's going to talk to the switch. 
and it's going to actually there it's going to log its mac address in there and it's already going to know where it's at but for the simplicity's sake of showing this um, we'll just say that it didn't know that the, the pc was plugged in there so the switch is like great now i know where you're at here this information is for you so this is kind of like your local mail service. Your local mail person pretty much knows who you are, where you live, so they can take a look at the message and say, oh yeah, this stack of mail is for this person, this stack of mail is for that person, and it's easy for them to move that information around. So they get a message for somebody else they really don't know, they're going to send it back to the post office, and the post office is going to take a look, and it's going to take care of it from there. Now when we look at our plug-and-play application, if PCE was running our software and it was looking for PowerNet readers, it would basically send a message to the switch, and the switch would broadcast that information out throughout its network looking for actual PowerNet devices. So now let's move to layer three, or the network layer. The network layer provides data transmission between nodes on separate networks. We just can't have one gigantic network with everything communicating on it. Nothing would ever work right. The main items in this layer are IP addresses and routers. IP addresses are basically a number we assign to a device to communicate on an IP network. A router sends packets between IP networks and it blocks broadcast traffic. So when a device is looking for something and the switch broadcasts it out, once that broadcast hits a router, it stops that broadcast dead. So if you have multiple networks with our plug and play application and you're on network A and there's some power nets on network D and you're broadcasting for it, it's not gonna be able to see it. So what is an IP address? An IP address is four octets of eight bits each numbering zero to 255. And if you're familiar with binary, we know that eight digits in binary can count from zero to 255. So this IP address is basically divided into two parts, our network and our host. Our network portion of the address does not change. Our host portion does. How do we know this? We know this because we have a subnet mask assigned to here. So a subnet mask is a logical invisible subdivision of IP addresses. With IP version 4, which we're looking at here, there just were not enough addresses for everything on the network, for everything in the world basically. We had already run out back in the 90s. So they came up with this clever way of using subnetting to get more addresses out of what we already had. So if we take a look at it, there's basically two types of addresses. There's public and there's private addresses. If you take a look at a modem or a cable modem in your house, you basically have a public address that's coming in from the street and you have private addresses within your home because you couldn't get 10, 20 addresses from your ISP, it would cost you a fortune. So you have one address that's dynamic and then you have addresses inside that everything communicates to that modem to and then back out to the internet. When we look at the subnet mask, you can see it's 255.255.255.0. Our 255s are all ones. That means that portion of the address is static. So our 192, 168, 100 portion will not change. We look at our host portion, which is zeros, that number actually can change. So 0 to 255, we have 256 addresses. Two of them are reserved for multicast and broadcast and other things. So basically we have 254 addresses that we can use down here. So an IP address is kind of like a postal address. The network portion is basically the street and the host portion is the address. Your street name doesn't change, but your address number does. So now let's take a look at a little more complicated IP address. Still looks the same here, everything looks pretty similar except it's different numbers to us. Now let's take a look at our subnet mask and where our network and host fall. So we have a 255255, that's easy enough, the 172 and the 16 won't change. But this is a little different, we have a 240. So if you look at the ones from left to right, it stops kind of in the middle there. That means that the third octet can actually change some, and the fourth octet, because it's all zeros, that can be anything from 0 to 255. In order to understand subnetting a little bit better, we're going to take a look at an online subnet calculator, subnet-calculator.com. On the upper left, we can see they have three different network classes. There's actually five, but the other two are used for testing. A, B, and C are primarily what you're going to see out there. So we look at the IP address 192.168.0.1. This is a classic Class C address that is used in just about every home router out there. On our right hand side we can see we have 254 hosts per subnet. 
so we can assign 254 addresses on the subnet or network. Our host range is going to be .1 to .254, because remember, with 255.255.255.0, our first three octets will not change, only our last octet will change for the address. Our subnet ID is .0 and our broadcast address is .255. So when we need to communicate to everything on a network, we're gonna broadcast on 192.168.0.255. So let's take a look at the class B address that we pulled up in our slide. It was 172.16.13.50. Our subnet mask was 255.255.240. So now that we have that set up within the subnet calculator, we can see that we have 4,094 hosts per subnet. Of course, no switch goes up that big. You would have more switches on that network. But we could attach 4,094 devices and assign every single one a unique IP address. Our host range would be 172.16.0.1 Our ID, of course, is .0.0, .0 but our broadcast address is .15.255. And that's where we're only using part of the bits of that third octet for our network and part of it for our host, which is why the third octet will change a little bit, but the fourth octet can change from anywhere from 0 to 255. So this subnet is unique. If we wanted to talk to another IP address, which may be on another subnet, such as .60.50, that's going to be on a totally different subnet. We can see our, our address range is .48.1 to .63.254. So in order to communicate for those devices to communicate, they would need a router in between them to translate between the two networks. So even though it looks like it may be on a similar network, if we look at the subnet mask, it tells us that it's actually on a separate network. So if you get a range of addresses, you can always just double check just to make sure that the IT guy did his math and then they got a subnet mask correct, because every once in a while they will make a mistake and you will not be able to communicate to something on the network. So let's take a look at how a router works. And first we have a switch in there. So if host one wants to send something to host two, very simple. The frame goes to switch one, gets sent out to host two. Maybe it has to broadcast for it, but it eventually gets there, no problem. Now host one wants to send something to host three. We have our IP addresses of our PCs. And then again, if you've ever assigned an IP address to something, pretty much everything has a default gateway. And the default gateway is the address of the router. So when a PC doesn't know where the IP address is at and it's trying to find it, it sends it to the default gateway and says, here, go find this for me. So this packet we're going to send to host 3, it's going to go to the default gateway. So it's going to go to the switch. The switch knows to send it out to router 1. Router 1 takes it and says, okay, I've got to send it out this link to router 2. Router 2 pulls that information in, and it says, oh, I know where that's at. It sends it on to host 3. Now, typically between router 2 and host 3, there'd be a switch as well. But for simplicity's sake, router 2 will just send it to host 3. Now let's talk about layer 4, the transport layer. The transport layer provides data transmission between nodes on one or more networks while maintaining quality of service. The main items we are interested in are the two protocols, TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, and UDP, User Datagram Protocol, as well as TCP ports. TCP and IP work very closely to ensure data gets where it needs to go efficiently and correctly. So the main difference between a TCP transmission and a UDP transmission is that TCP is reliable. It monitors message transmission, tracks data transfer to ensure receipt of all packets. So if we're going to send an email, it's going to use TCP because we want to ensure that 100% of that message arrives to the other end. So if one of the packets is damaged on the way there, the other end will know and it will say, hey, please resend this portion of the message. Now UDP is unreliable. There's no concept of acknowledgement, retransmission, or timeout. So UDP can be used in video conferencing over the internet, where we don't care if we lose a couple packets here and there, and we don't want to slow down the video transmission by having the protocols underneath try to request other packets that have been dropped from a video stream that was already sent a few seconds ago. So IP addresses allow hosts to communicate, but ports allow applications to communicate. One host can communicate to multiple applications via these ports. Otherwise, we'd have to have servers for every single service that we have out there. There are 65,535 total ports that can be used. 
Some ports are registered for use, such as SMTP and POP3, which are used for email. You have DNS, HTTP for web traffic, and a host of other ports out there. If you're changing a port from the default that an application is using, you have to check first to make sure that it's not in use by something else. Because if you have two applications on the same host trying to use the same port, you're going to end up with problems. So let's take a look at how a port connects. Host 1 wants to communicate to an application on host 3. So again, we're going to send our packet to the switch. The switch will send it to the router, and the router will send it to the other router. Now this router may have an application called a firewall running inside of it. So if we're trying to communicate, let's say, on port 8080, this firewall running is going to inspect that packet and that packet is destined for port 8080 and it's going to say well my rule is to deny any traffic that's coming in that's looking for port 8080 so it can actually drop that packet there so let's say the firewall says that the packet's good the router will just like on a normal router it will send it over to host 3 and host 3 will process the packet now once that happens they're basically going to make a connection through the network so those applications will easily be able to transmit data back and forth so of course summary we talked about how devices communicate on the network hubs switches and routers we talked about some of the key protocols used on the network relevant to an ISONIS installation, um, IP and TCP, basically. We talked about how this affects the ISONIS plug and play application. So ISONIS plug and play is going to broadcast out looking for ISONIS devices. On a switch, that's no problem because switches will transmit broadcast traffic. But as soon as that broadcast traffic hits a router, the router will block that broadcast traffic. So if you have separate networks, you'll need to pre-configure the IP addresses or you'll need to run the plug and play on each separate network. And then we talked a little bit about how the different network devices work together. So a PC sends information to a switch, a switch goes to a router, a router sends it across the network to another router, back down the switch to another PC. Thank you for attending this course. We hope it was beneficial to you. Have a great day.